Hey everybody, it's Weird Islanders, the podcast back once again. My name is Dan, that is Mike. How are you this evening, Mike? Well, I'm jacked up. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite players ever. A, a player who I think, at times, eh, might be might have been the best hockey player on the planet. There were some <laughs> shifts where this guy just was mesmerizingly good, mm. and... I don't understand how it didn't click. Like, I just never understood how this guy was a journeyman, how he didn't just stay with the Islanders and become their all-time leader in points and power play points and have his name in the rafters. Mm. Uh, it, it was, I, I, I am being hyperbolic, obviously, but it, there were shifts where you're just watching this guy like, damn, that was amazing. <laughs> um, he played a huge part in, in a, lot of, uh, a lot of my favorite games from a wonderful season that we had. Mm. And he he really revitalized a, a team uh, at one point when, when the Islanders traded for him uh, the second time mm. uh, he really revitalized the team. So, and, and like really got made me just a huge, huge fan of him. Uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to get into this guy. Uh, we've been waiting for this one. This is the third season of uh, weird Islanders. And yeah. this is a guy who, if, if I wasn't one of the hosts and I got to pick a, a player, I think he would be, maybe it would be between him and Chris Osgood for who I would pick as my, my, my weird Islander. This guy in, in researching him has, we've, there's a ton of fun facts. The numbers are really strange and he could be a weird player for about half the league, uh, which is kind of funny. Uh, and he's just a very, very unique player. And I can't wait to get to him. I was so excited when our guest chose him and let's bring our guest on now. He is a writer for Pennsburg and for Bleacher Report and a few other places as well. He, you've probably seen him on Twitter and he's just an all around great guy and he's Adam Gretz. Adam, how are you? I'm great. How are you guys today? We are excellent. Uh, it's great to finally talk to you. We've known each other uh, through Twitter and, and the SB Nation network for a long time. So it's great to, to put a voice to a name and, and get, a, get you on here. Um, I think it's safe to say that this season for the Penguins hasn't quite gone the way I think a lot of people kind of figured it would. Um, Mike and I at different points of this season and talking about the Islanders on our flagship show, Islanders Anxiety, have talked about how sometimes it just feels like something is rotten on the roster. Like it's, you know, th these guys, sometimes they look good and sometimes they just don't. And we can't put a finger on it because like on paper, they should be much better than this. Is, has that sort of phenomenon kind of happened with the Penguins a little bit? Or is there something more tangible that you can point to yeah I, I think there's a lot of that um if, if you look at them on paper you you look at the top of the lineup and Sidney Crosby's still playing right. at an outrageous Seriously. level for a guy that's what 36 years old now I mean, right. he's still one of the best players in the world um you know Chris Letang is still playing well they trade for Eric Carlson there should be something mm -hmm. um it just hasn't worked. The, the, mm. If you look at the at the at the power play they can put on the ice, it's terrible. It's yeah, awful. It, it's, it's really it's, wild. It, it, <laughs> it's it, so bad. It, it's not just bad. It, it's yeah. awful. Like it, it's actively losing them games. Wow. And there, there's been off the top of my head, I can count two games this season where they have had a power play in a tie game with less than two minutes to play. And they have lost in regulation. <laughs> and in one of those games, that power play was a two man advantage. Oh my God. Oh, I remember that one. That, that was, was uh, tough, Anaheim right? early this yes. season. Uh, oh, Mason yeah. McTavish came out of the penalty yep. box and, and scored with like 30 seconds left in regulation. Yeah. And I, I think there's a couple things at play. Um, number one, you know, those guys that I just mentioned, they are older. Um, you know, I, I think if Genny Malkin has shown that more than Crosby and Latang have, he's clearly a fraction of what he once was. Um, and I think they've also they've just made a series of bad decisions with the roster around those guys. Yeah, and I, you know, it it goes back over over pretty much three general managers now, <laughs> and. It started after they won that last cup in 2017 when Jim Rutherford decided it wasn't good enough to just win the games. He also wanted to win the fights. So he mm. went out and traded for Ryan Reeves. Yes. Which was a complete 180 <laughs> from the way those teams played. 
Mm-hmm. Like those, th- I mean, th- that team had Phil Kessel skating on the third line. They were that mm-hmm. deep offensively, and that wasn't good enough. So mm-hmm. he went and, and he was, and I remember, I believe it was before game one of that Stanley Cup final against Nashville. He was literally talking about how he needed to go and get somebody to to fight. Like huh. he, he's getting ready and I'm just sitting there like <laughs> dumbfounded. Like am, am I funny. in bizarro world here? Like what, yeah. what Like, are you watching the team you've built? Yeah. And, that reminds me of uh, Eugene Malkin talking about how the senators might move just before they're about to host an outdoor game. Yeah. Like right in front of parliament. <laughs> like, like, dude, what are you like, doing? <laughs> like, what, what, what is your timing here, man? Right. <laughs> and, and he he was just so mad. Like, and, 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 and it all goes back to one guy. It all goes to, back to Tom Wilson. Yeah, I was going to say. And, yeah. and Tom Wilson absolutely got so far into their heads mm-hmm. that it completely changed the way they built their team. And that was when they were beating Tom Wilson's team. <laughs> like, in that, That's like, funny. from that point on, mm-hmm. Rutherford just completely shifted the way he built the team. That kind of resulted in them taking a step back. Then he abruptly leaves, which yeah. nobody fully understands why. Huh. And then they hire Ron Hextall. Former Weird Islanders uh, star, Ron Hextall. We did a whole episode on him. I can absolutely <laughs> imagine that. Um, and that two-year run was such a disaster. Yeah. Like, they, they lost Jared McCann for nothing. They, yeah. it, 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 like. You know how every team in the NHL royally screwed up the Vegas expansion draft and then everybody learned their lesson when Seattle came in? (laughs) Everybody except Ron Hextall learned his lesson because he (laughs) lost Jared McCann and Brandon Tanev so he could protect Jeff Carter in Mm. in that expansion draft, which was just a terrible decision. Um, Pretty much everything Hextall did was a disaster. So he gets fired. They bring in Kyle Dubas. And this is kind of where things, there, there seems to be two different factions of, of, of opinions in Pittsburgh right now, mm-hmm. where there's one group of people that thinks Kyle Dubas was brought in to eventually start the rebuild and be the person that, that, that guides that. There's another group of people that thinks he was brought in to try to maximize what was left of Sidney Crosby's career. Right. Yeah. And when you look at the roster moves they made this off season, it's clear which one he was trying to do. This <laughs> yeah, like, seriously. Almost every player he acquired was somebody over the age of 30 that has a multi-year contract. Yeah. Riley Smith had two years left when they traded for him. Eric Carlson has four years left. He signed Nola Chari for three years. He signed Lars Eller for two years. Mm. He signed Ryan Graves for six years. Mm. That's Those aren't the types of moves you make if you're brought in to usher in a rebuild. Yeah, seriously. And other like Carlson hasn't been bad, but he hasn't been what they expected. He, mm. He's been good when they expected Norris Trophy and 100 points. Now, that might have been an unrealistic expectation, but I, I think the expectation was he would come in, he would be a difference maker, he would fix the power play that wasn't very good a year ago, and it just mm-hmm. hasn't happened. But he, he yeah. like he, I, I wouldn't say he's been a problem. He just right. hasn't been what they hoped. Yeah. So yeah, something something on the roster is weird. Yeah, yeah I, I totally. And then, hear and then the other guys they brought in, mm-hmm. like he had to overhaul the bottom six. And he he tried to build this group of players down there that could defend, but nobody can score. So now they're they're pretty <laughs> much they're pretty much a one line team. Yeah. And you you can't win in the NHL with one line. And yeah. and I think that's where it's really gone wrong. And I also think Mike Sullivan, for as great as he's been with the Penguins, I think sometimes a coach and a team just reach their breaking point where it's time to move on. And it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that he's a bad coach. Sometimes yeah. you just, you just reach a point where the message doesn't get through anymore. I think they're there. He hasn't adapted much to the, the, the team getting older. I don't think anybody expected them to win a Stanley cup this season here, 
Yeah. Uh, we are recording this a couple of days before the trade deadline. And uh, I listen, there are going to be 31 teams dying for the Penguins to fire Mike Sullivan at the end of the season. So I don't think anybody thinks he's he's suddenly forgotten how to coach. But uh, hey, listen, you know, two Stanley Cups and and he's been there. It's a 10 years or close to 10 years. That's a long time. 2015-16, uh, that 2015-16 that wow, so. season, he came in halfway through. Right. Uh, he replaced Mike Johnston. That's right. That's right. So, you know, you're looking at eight years. That's a long time. And I mean, you can't, can't argue with the success. So uh, yeah, no, it, it's, it's funny. Like I remember when people complaining all the time about Barry Trotz when he coached the Islanders. And then once the Islanders let him go, I saw tweets from everywhere being like, Oh my God, my team's got to hire this guy. Well, it was like, wait, hold on a second. Like, hold on a second. Is he, is he the scourge of the NHL or is he the guy who's going to save your franchise? It's, it's one or the other. So, uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's been fascinating to watch and uh, I'm sure it hasn't been a lot of fun if you're a Penguins fan and a Penguins writer such as yourself, but uh, you know, the good news is that uh, everybody at The Athletic is watching. So uh, that's the uh, that's the most important thing because uh, their favorite son is uh, is running the team. But we are here to talk about a very different era in Penguins hockey. Uh, and that might be good or it might be bad. I don't know. We'll ask you. Uh, and we have a very fascinating Penguin here and a former two-time Islander and a whole lot of other things. So let us get to him today. Let us talk about our featured guest. Adam Gretz, will you please reveal the subject of tonight's episode of Weird Islanders, the podcast? Tonight's Weird Islander is none other than Randy Robitaille. <laughs> I can already hear Mike getting ready. He's, he's right. getting amped up. <laughs> Before, Hold on, I'm going to throw it to you in a second. Before we go, do, reminder that we are on Patreon, patreon.com slash Islanders Anxiety. Add free episodes, bonus content, a whole lot more. Sign up today. Mike, when you hear the words Randy Robitaille, what is the first thing that you think of? The Islanders goal horn at the Nassau Coliseum <laughs> after uh, during a power play. Uh, yes, and I'm not even kidding. Goal horn, by the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, the best goal horn. Yes. And uh, there just there was just magic in this guy's hands when he was with the Islanders somehow. <laughs> and there's one game in particular that that sticks out, and it's a game I talk about all the time. And you know, it's perfect because it actually um, was against the Penguins. In uh, that 2006-7 series, uh, season when the Islanders made that miracle run into the playoffs with Dublowitz. Um And there was a turning point game in that season when the Penguins were riding a 16-game point streak. And the Islanders uh, played them. The Islanders were in desperate need of a win. They had traded for Marc-Andre Bergeron a few days before. Um, so they were kind of dipping their toes into being a buyer. But they were in they were in pretty poor form and they were looking to rescue the season and they were playing really well against the penguins in this game. Uh, Ryan Malone, as he always did, oh had a hat gosh. trick against the Call Islanders. The killer. In this game. Absolute Islanders killer. I could never yeah. figure it out. Crazy. Oh, God. And this game was just it was incredible. So Malone's opened the scoring like a minute in. Um Victor Kozlov got uh got the Islanders tied one one uh about you know fifteen minutes later and Bergeron was had an assist on the play. I was at this game the Coliseum is rocking because Bergeron, I think it was his debut mm-hmm. and Mark Recchi scored right before the, uh, the intermission. Then Malone scored a minute. In, this was the, his hat trick game where he scored all three goals in the first minute of each period. Oh my God. Um, so he scored on a, in the first minute of the second, all of a sudden it looks like the Islanders are about to be dead in the water. And then the Randy Robitaille show starts. A nice referee. Don Koharski made the call. Here's Robitaille centering and Simon scores. Took the Islanders a minute and 14 seconds to get it back. Neither team wants 26 straight games without a goal. And so the Islanders now within a goal. Blake draws a penalty. Roll the tie to Blake. He scores! And the Islanders have tied it. There was going to be a penalty. Jason Blake, who had not scored in his last eight, has tied it 3-3. to Two goals in 15 seconds. Robitaille up to the Pittsburgh line, across to Simon, he scores! Chris Simon had not scored in 26 games. He has two in this one. It took a minute 11 for the Islanders to get it back, and we're even 5-5. Five to five. And so Pass many 
many times in this game it looked like the Penguins were on the verge of grabbing control of it. the third star of this game. Great dishes in the second period. Great pass. Sillinger with a game-winning goal. How about Chris Simon with two? And the first star from the He's Islanders, number, one. number 12, Chris Simon! Well, the Chief came to play today. And he sets up Chris <laughs> Simon for the first time in the night. Then he sets up Jason Blake. The Islanders then go up 4-3, then it's 4-4, Malone scores again for the hat trick, and then Randy Robitaille gets right back to work a minute later and, and sets up Chris Simon, and the game end, ends up culminating with a, a Mike Sillinger goal um, with about 30 seconds left in regulation after an, a shift where Crosby had the puck for like two minutes on his on a stick <laughs> below the Islanders' goal line. And, I, and there was one point where Rick DiPietro was like trying to poke check him away, like he basically skated out of the crease. But I what I remember about this game was that and I'm not kidding you. Like when, when I when I made that statement off the jump, mm. Randy Robitaille was the best hockey player on the planet that night. Like there was <laughs> nobody, there was nobody that could stop that guy. He had three yeah. assists on the night. The he he was running uh, the kind of the the trigger man, or or I should say like the the kind of uh, the string puller on a on a power play where the three forwards were him, Victor Kozlov, and Aaron Asham. Jeez. Aaron Asher on the power play? Yeah. And oh and God. there's a great, you know, our, our guy uh, our guy Sab on on uh yeah. on YouTube has a has a whole whole, you know, 20 20 minute video about this game. And there's a big Howie Rose is like talking about how Asham's on the power play and the Islanders need to uncork that shot and who who's like just absolutely working magic on this first in the first period on this power <laughs> play but but uh but Robotai drawing people to him finding space he, he was so good this night and i just remember thinking like the islanders they they have something here yeah but then you think or you know back then i you, i wouldn't think this but you look at his hockey reference page and that that part of the site that's just reserved for uh the players numbers oh my god randy robitaille has three six nine eleven thirteen <laughs> different squares with a number in it yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's that guy that guy's the best player in the world <laughs> like, he, he, could, he could be a weird million different things he could be a weird yeah. bruin a weird penguin he could be a weird king he could be a weird wild he could be a weird fly the only team he couldn't be weird for is the nashville predators because he showed up in their second year so the not the inaugural predators but i guess the second inaugural predators whatever you call it uh and played 131 games there but yeah he, he this guy has bounced around a lot and i gotta be honest I am shocked that somebody other than like a, a Predators fan or another Islanders fan would have picked Randy Robitaille. So Adam, like I gave you a, a smaller list of, you know, kind of Islanders penguins. There were some, some really wild names on there. I'm hoping to get on this show at some point, but like what made Randy Robitaille jump out on that list of, of Islanders and penguins? Cause again, I'm, I'm shocked that anybody even remembers this guy outside of us basically. So there's actually a couple of things in, in, in the way the way Mike was talking about watching Randy Robitaille. That's kind of the way that <laughs> that I remember his time in Pittsburgh. That's funny <laughs> because wow. this was his time in Pittsburgh. This was in that that weird time between Yarmer Yager after like yes. after Yager was traded and before Sidney Crosby. Yeah, so I'm glad you're talking about this because I do want to talk to you about this. But yeah, continue. The, there was. There was that three-year stretch where they just tanked. They absolutely bottomed out. And in a couple of those seasons, they were just claiming anybody they could get on waivers. <laughs> they were trading for any bottom-of-the-lineup player that they could get to just fill out a lineup and try to have like a somewhat competitive NHL team. Mm. And Randy Robitaille was one of those guys. And when he first got to Pittsburgh – he was surprisingly productive, right. and there, there were, I, I remember like, and, and I was in, a, I, I think I was, I think I was a senior in high school at this time. It was somewhere around mm -hmm. like senior year of high school, first year of college, and the Penguins were so bad at this time, <laughs> and interest in them had, had really dwindled. And to get people into the building, they introduced this program called the Student Rush Program where you would 
an hour before the game, hour before puck drop, if you showed up at the ticket window with a valid student ID or a report <laughs> card or yeah. anything that showed you were a high school or college student, you would get the best available seat wow. for $20. Gee. And we made a habit out of going to those sure. games. We were sitting like three rows from the glass <laughs> watching just terrible yeah. hockey but loving yeah. every minute of it. That's and so funny. Randy Robitaille was one of those – like. Somebody on like on, on bad teams, somebody's going to get the goals. There's right. going to be somebody that's going to get power play time. They're going to get top line time, and they're going to come out of nowhere and have a surprisingly good year. And mm-hmm. I think Randy Robitaille just happened to be one of those guys for those Penguins teams, and he played really well. And I remember going up to that that trade deadline. There was talk that oh they might they might be looking to trade Randy Robitaille. And I remember me and my group of friends just like being angry at that thought. Like, no, you can't trade him. <laughs> like, he's the only guy scoring right now. What are you doing? So it, it was just it was just hilarious listening to Mike go into that story because I'm I'm sitting there thinking, that's how I felt about Randy. <laughs> yeah. You know what's funny is uh, the Islanders had a similar program. I I think it was yes. I can't remember what it was called, but the year that I used it and uh, and you know and abused it was the Randy Robitaille years. Like yeah. wow. I, so Randy Robitaille was just, people were, gl- right. he was the student ID special. I guess that Mr. Student discount. Yeah. Yeah. Like Mr. Student <laughs> discount. That program was so popular with the penguins. Like people would start showing up at like 8 AM to line up to get like the best available seats. Wow. And after they got good again, like mm-hmm. after Crosby came, obviously that changed everything. People actually wanted to go now. They would like for the first, maybe like, five to six years of Crosby's career, they would hold like 600 tickets a night Mm. to open up to the student rush. Mm. And like people again would show up at like ridiculous hours and players would like bring out pizza to them. (laughs) And it it was like a college like tailgating atmosphere, but it it was a great program because it got a lot of people hooked on hockey Mm. and um, we got to watch Randy Robitaille. Yeah. Yeah. We had, um, we had, the Islanders had a student discount thing too. And, and my friend Gio and I, I'm a little bit older than, than you and Mike here, but, uh, we used to go to games all the time, but there was not a best available seat. I don't know why that, you know, I'm thinking about it. I don't know why the Islanders didn't do that. Cause we used to, they used to give us terrible seats. They were like right up against the, the last row of the Coliseum when nobody was there. And so by the end of the first period, you'd get an usher who would see you up there and he'd kind of like wave you down, like, come on, come on, come on. And then you'd go down to the 200s. There's a much nicer seat, you know, but, Nothing as good as as behind the glass, but hey, listen, you know, sometimes you know you gotta get you gotta do what it takes to get people in the building. But before we move on to more Rovertai, I do want to stay on this because again, this is an era I don't know if a lot of you know younger people know about this. So this, like you said, this was the transitional period between Yager and Crosby. Um, this was when Mario Lemieux had come back to play, but he was also the owner which is kind of a weird thing. I remember this is when I was working at the Associated Press and it was always like player owner, Mario Lemieux. And it was me, a friend and I who were both hockey fans. Just like, that's so weird. It's so weird that the owner is playing, on, but they had to, like they needed somebody to play. He was probably their, their second best player really um, uh, behind uh, Alexei Kovalev was also on these teams. Um, and it's just kind of like, I get, you know, Mike and I talk about these things all the time. Cause we, I mean, this is what this whole show is about. It's kind of carrying this, this baggage around from these weird transitional eras we have the mercenary era before the the Tavares rebuild we have the truly truly dark awful times between the Ziggy Palfy trade and when yeah. Charles Wong bought the team and and brought in like Michael Peck and, and Alexei Yashin what is like sort of a normal penguins fans relationship to this particular era which again you know fits right in between these two super 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 hall of fame superstars uh but it's just sort of like do they look about it fondly they try and forget about it. Do they, does the team kind of like try and just ignore it <laughs> just pretend it doesn't happen? Like what, what's sort of the relationship like there now after obviously so much success with the Crosby era? Well, the team itself totally ignores it. Like, <laughs> like there's no, there's almost no reference to it. Mm-hmm. And um, like you mentioned Alexi Kovalev, like he was a yeah. great player for the yeah. Penguins, and like he, very little memory of him associated hmm. with the team. 
Like there's there's a mural outside of their locker room that has him. He's he has like he has like a random picture like in the corner of it. But like they they don't really reference that time much. Right. I think fans, especially fans of like my age hmm. from that era, they mostly look back at it with fondness because yeah. of what it helped produce. Yeah, well, like those, yeah. Those, like everybody knew at the time when they start when they when they traded Kovalev, when they traded Yager, when when the and um, you know Marty Straka got traded. Um, I think that's another weird Islander. I was gonna team. say he's gonna get his own episode yeah. of this. I probably um, Dick Tarnstrom. But Dick Tarnstrom, oh, definitely. Dick Tarnstrom, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, he led the team in scoring one, one of these. Yes, like, yes. He, he was like literally. They, they claimed him on waivers before the start of the season, and he led the team in scoring that. Year. Um, like that's how bad they were. Yeah. Um, but I think fans knew that, okay, like we're going through a really bad period here. I don't think anybody in their wildest dreams at the time envisioned that they would get two more superstars, like mega stars, like back to back. I don't think anybody anticipated that, but I think people knew that there was at least something of a plan. Um, I also think there's, there's a, there's a sense of fondness to it because people were just trying to grasp onto the franchise because the long-term stability of the team yes. was not a given. Absolutely. Like, like yeah. there was, there was very, even after Crosby arrived, there was still a chance that if they didn't get an arena, they were going to be in Kansas city yeah, or yeah. some other city. So like, I think people just tried to embrace the team while it was there. They they kind of knew that they 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 at least had a vision. They were trying to, you know, build something up and obviously it produced, you know, 15, 16 years of of greatness and I I think that makes it easier to look back on with fondness, mm-hmm. but I I think fans appreciate those 3 years. Um the organization you know, <laughs> it, it, it's just like it's a transitional phase between the Lemieux Yager teams and the Crosby yeah. Malkin teams because you know for ten years in the in the nineties the Lemieux Yager teams were also really good they won two yes. cups yeah. and um you know then obviously Crosby and Malkin did what what they've done um but like I also remember another vivid memory I have of that time period actually involves the Islanders in a weird way because I remember everybody knew Yager's last season in Pittsburgh was his last season in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I remember that. They went to the Eastern Conference Finals that year. They were a really good team. That was the year Lemieux came back. He came out of retirement after That's staying right. up for three years and averaged yeah. like almost two points per game. It was yeah, just it was sick. Yeah. <laughs> like in the middle of the dead puck era too when mm. nobody was scoring. Um but everybody knew Yager was was going to be gone. He wanted out. He made the comment that he was like dying alive, which actually still <laughs> gets a lot of play. Like people still <laughs> reference that here because it was just such an absurd quote. And right. looking back on it in hindsight, it's hilarious. But I remember when they were going into that off season, and this is obviously before you know Twitter and, and social mm-hmm. media and twenty four seven you know rumor mongering. I'd be getting like my my trade rumors like once a week from ESPN.com. Oh yeah. And I remember the Islanders were one of the teams that got mentioned as a possible landing spot for Yarmer Yager. Oh there was God. the Islanders, there was the Rangers, and I think there was one other team. And the the rumored offer from the Rangers was just like a bunch of their crap. Like it was like <laughs> bad contracts that they didn't want. And I remember thinking, man, I really want him to go to the Islanders because I really, <laughs> I really wanted Brad Isbister and Dave Scatcherd as part of the return and the trade. Wow. <laughs> hey, two, fa- two favorites. Hey, I don't blame you. Yeah, yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> like, Come on. Like, those were the guys I wanted of all the players that were getting rumored. And then yeah, he ended amazing. up going to Washington for, you know, just three nobodies. Uh, Chris right. Beach was the... Yeah, the the, the the top guy there. I, I remember the cap sort of coming out of nowhere, yes. and people being like, "Huh? Like what?" But then, okay. but then, like later on, I think that was was that the same year the Islanders traded for Yashin, and they ended up giving up like you know Chara and Jason Spezza. And like, that <laughs> like, would have been well, two thousand and one. Yeah, yeah, that I, yeah, that yeah. Been the year. 
Yeah. So like they, they couldn't get that offer. They they got Chris Beach <laughs> and Michael Civic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could have had Chara, I guess. So wow, I gotta tell you, I never heard that. I, I know going back before this, there was the uh, the flirtation with Jeremy Roenick, which I think was kind of Mike Milbury being like, "Hey, Jr., you want to play for the Islanders?" And him being like, uh, "Well, if you give me X amount of money," and him being like, "Yeah, that's not gonna happen." It was very very brief. But uh, I have never heard this this Yager thing before. I need to investigate this. That's pretty wild. I, I just uh, can't imagine what it was. I, I, I want to oh have my, my own podcast to listen to what it was like to live through the Mike Mulberry era. <laughs> oh, my God. Don't oh even. God. You don't want to know. Trust yeah. me. Uh, the, the, the Yashin trade was one of the actual highlights, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> just, that's, how, that's how you know what it was like. Um, yeah. But about this, this that Penguins era, like, the, the Penguins have haunted the Islanders, and, and not so much like in, in the recent recent years but before barry trotz like the, you know Sidney crosby just lived in our basement basically <laughs> and um uh, but before crosby like i used to love going to islander penguins games for that reason like I, i'll be like oh what you know this is a game the islanders have a good chance to win yeah uh thomas is T- thomas uh Sorovi isn't really scaring yeah. me and and john sebastian or ban yeah. or or sebastian Caron in goal like yeah. The Islanders, um, I feel like they they had like a little bit of a a run against the Penguins in those early two thousands, and because I think a lot of the NHL did, but yeah, a and, lot of the league did. Yeah, yeah. exactly, right. and because they were in the same division, I I ended up going. You know, they played a lot more back then in division, so I feel like I saw a ton of these yeah, early two thousand Penguins teams, and the one thing I I remember about them is I I know that like they um they had what's his face um he ended up going with the range playing with the rangers uh roosevelt yes. oh michael roosevelt yeah. yeah yeah and i just i just it was like this guy i hated him i just i don't know what it was i don't care if he like plastered maybe jason blake or something but like for some reason i hated him mm-hmm. and that hatred not obviously didn't go away when he ended up going to the rangers well, but, it, uh, it, it's funny because the, that penguins team that that era, they had a couple of guys in their defense that they were just not very good in Pittsburgh. Michael Roosevelt was one of them. Andrew Ferentz was another. Yeah. And those guys ended up playing like almost two decades in the league. <laughs> like it, it was crazy because right. I like they were like the, they were like the number one and two defensemen on the worst team in hockey, mm. and they ended up like winning Stanley Cups and, and having like these these. Yeah extensive careers i think Hmm. i think i want to say they both played a thousand games in the league uh i'll give you one ian moran almost 500 games he seemed like he never wanted to leave he's just always around but uh yeah no this was uh joseph melikar i remember from that era to me that penguins era i always remember uh darius kasparitis like having get traded there and being like man what is he doing on this team it's so weird but uh yeah this was a very a very strange time like you said they're just picking up people Left and right, trying to keep the team in Pittsburgh all this time, trying to get a new arena. And let me tell you, we we know all about that, that kind of thing. Um, and so into this will come Randy Robitaille. But let's back it up a little bit and talk about how we got here. So he's from Ottawa originally, uh, went to Miami of Ohio, played there, went undrafted. He's one of the very few weird Islanders we've talked about here who wasn't drafted. Was originally signed by the Boston Bruins, and he gets his first shot at the NHL in March of 1997 and on his first shift in his first game he gets hit into the boards and he separates his shoulder and he is out for the remainder of the season oh, God. and doing the hitting was ken belanger who was playing for the new york islanders at the time so <laughs> this guy has always been tied to the islanders Kim Sweeney, number 42 for boston Claren, John Roloff are the defense pair. LaPointe for the Islanders works it free. Jump behind the net by Robitaille. He shoved hard to the boards by Belange of the Islanders. Tim Sweeney lost it to Lachance. There was the hard hit. That one at the expense of Robitaille as he gets a taste. Randy Robitaille there. Woo. Welcome to the NHL, young fella. It's so incredible to I'm watching this video and I'm like, Wait a minute. This is I think I just read about this. This is his first game. So, that's it. His season is done. His that would would have been his, you know, I guess he was trying to burn off the ELC or whatever and that's it. He's done. 147 seconds into his first shift, it's over. But he spends another couple of seasons with the Bruins. I guess plays in Providence for a little while. 
And then it is on to the Nashville Predators. Uh, he gets, actually, excuse me, he gets traded by the Bruins to the Atlanta Thrashers. Then for Peter Ferraro, Long Island native, and uh, his brother played for the Islanders, of course, Chris. And then the Thrashers trade Robitaille to the Nashville Predators for tough guy Denny Lambert. And it's in Nashville, again, in the early years, that uh, he really makes uh, his entrance into the NHL. He ends up spending... Uh, 131 games with the Predators, 20 goals, 51 points. He would play for Atlanta, but it would happen a lot later. He ends up signing with the Kings in July of 2001, and the Kings are who put him on waivers, and that's how he ends up in Pittsburgh. So after, you know, we know how important Robitaille was to the Penguins at some point and to a young Penguins fan such as yourself, but like when they, do you have any memory of them picking him up on waivers did you think at the time wow this is a good pickup or again was just sort of like a who the hell is this type of scenario here it was uh, a, who the hell is this type of yeah. scenario <laughs> because they had so many guys like mm-hmm. that come through the team those years that right. it was just like well it'll be here for a couple weeks and, and that'll right. be it and and then he had 30 points in 40 games <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and then you're mad that like why are you gonna trade him <laughs> right. It, it's actually fun. We'll get to it in a second. But again, his numbers are really weird. Like he would end up playing 81 games for the Penguins and he had 47 points. Yeah. Like that's over half a point a game. Like that's that's good. What is in, he doing? Especially <laughs> in that era. Right. Like, like right. That, was, yeah. that was when like that was the height of the neutral zone trap. Right. And when it, it was like every game was played in mud. Like, it, it was. <laughs> putting up those numbers was, was no small accomplishment. Right. It's, it's just funny that like, and this would continue for his career. He basically was a, a half a point, a game player for an entire career spending like 10 different teams over 11 years. It's crazy. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price. Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's cousin Kevin's kazoo concert in Kansas city, go Kevin or Becky's bachelorette bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. It, it was definitely a muddy, you know, the dead puck era, whatever you want to call it, skating in mud. And it's true. Like the scoring was definitely down at that point, but like, I don't know, maybe some guys just kind of excel at that point. You, you were talking before about how even on a bad team, somebody's got to score that to us is Mario Strakowski, who was a superstar for the Islanders uh, in the two worst seasons they had as a franchise. And I guess Robitaille is kind of one of those guys. Like, I mean, Mike, did you, you obviously are a huge, we'll get to the Islanders Robitaille in a minute, but like, you're you're a guy who's observed this this player a lot. I mean, is, do you remember something about his game that sort of translated into this style of play, where he, you know, speed and skill and de- deeks and dipsy doodles weren't part of the order of the day? Like this guy was maybe he's just he's a meat and potatoes type of guy, and it just worked for him in this era. You think? I think you know what he was really good at was uh, well, he's a, he's a really slick passer, like incredibly mm-hmm. slick passer. So back then. You know, you had the game moved a lot slower, as as we were just saying. So you had like, if if you were a step or half a step faster than someone, and pulled on the brakes, um, you ended up having a lot more time than than players do now. Like the skating level is just is is in a completely different universe. So Robitaille was just so good at when he had time and space to make um the pass to his second option. So he'd have like the obvious one. And he, it's something we see Matt Barzell do all the time now. Like you, you see him coming down on a rush mm-hmm. and you're like, okay, he's on like a semi two on one. There's another guy coming. He can, maybe he can force this through to Bo Horvat or something. And, and sometimes yeah. he does. And then other times you'll see him and the TV screen can't see it, but Mike Riley or Noah Dobson's up, coming up the rush on the other way or mm-hmm. something else. And, and he just pulls on the brakes and he makes that pass. And, uh, and Randy Robitaille to me did that. Um, <laughs> really well with the Islanders and and the one team I remember him well actually remember him with with two other teams uh besides the Islanders and Penguins like in my head I oh I remember I'm the Senators but that was after the Islanders yeah. but I remember him on the Nashville Predators right uh like you said that's when he kind of made his mark I guess and they had those um 
those jerseys with the silver sleeves I at love the time. Those. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I can picture him in that, that number 27 with, he had like the kind of a, a weird visor going. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I remember, I can remember him in, in those jerseys. Uh, I don't remember anything, you know, like, God, I, I, how would you be able to watch a Nashville Predators game from Long Island back then? I have no idea, right. but I do right. remember him, uh, a little bit just, and I remember him with the thrashers too. Um, yeah a bit so yeah, i do too uh and of course the penguins and islanders but the uh that's what i remember him he was such a good facilitator he was such mm-hmm. a good facilitator of uh of the play he's he had eyes in the back of his head and and like we were saying like he he had um 30 points in in 40 games or whatever it ended up being with the penguins and uh in in that one season and if you look at his numbers just down the the board with every stop he had he was basically producing at this yeah seriously half, just under half a point per game <laughs> clip so that, and there was never a, a there was never any on long island adam like i always say like like the you, you basically know everything about the team like you know that they're just kind of in in like in the community like they just live in the suburbs with the rest of us so rumors get out if like a guy is a you know a prick or has like a bad attitude or whatever so probably wasn't a bad guy so it wasn't like that was chasing him around the league um at least we don't think so so there were i have no idea it, it, it reminds me a little bit and i can't i hate myself for saying it because uh we hear his name all the time on on uh 32 thoughts and the jeff marrick show but it reminds me a little bit like daniel sprong like a guy who just goes <laughs> does the tour produces everywhere then signs another deal um but yeah he was he was just silky man he had great skates he had the silver skates mm. as well like he had really cool silver skates and um just a, a a player that i like i think if he was in this era that we're in now he's playing you know a, a thousand nhl games and, and i mean he yeah. he ended up which the crazy part here is a lot of times when we talk about these journeymen that will they end up with in their career with like 160 games played and, right. and one stop they have like 60 and that's yeah. the, the team that they played with the most and mm. Robotai played 531 NHL games <laughs> so it wasn't like he did it he was just like a your you know kind of run-of-the-mill three or four year journeyman who who kind of just Jason crogged his way around the NHL right. like this guy played 531 what? games it's crazy and in his last year too he wasn't bad he had 29 points in 68 games so right. I this, we got to find out, and he's come to alumni night a couple times on, on with the mm. Islanders. We got, I just right. got, we got to ask him. Be like, do you think that you, you deserve better? Like, what the hell? Yeah. We'll talk about what he's doing now uh, at the end here, but uh, but yeah, I mean, he was a productive player. Uh, I mean, Adam, do you remember any particular like uh, line mates he was with, or any kind of you know particular spots he was in, or the power play or something like that? I mean, he got a couple of power play goals I see for the Penguins here. Uh, but, uh, I mean, what else can you recall yeah, about that you know, time? It's funny. I was literally just sitting here trying to think of who he played right. alongside with. I'm guessing at the time, given the state of the roster at that point, he was given how productive he was, hmm. he was probably getting significant time with Kovalev. Yeah. And like, on the, cause I mean, he, he was one of the only guys producing hmm. and I, but I can't, I can't picture who he played with, but I, I can picture the skates and mm. I can picture the playmaking. Like he wow. was a very good, he, he, like he saw the ice. Well, he had good vision. He could make plays. Um, but I, I can't, I wish I could think of who he played alongside. Yeah. I, it's totally escaping me. I mean, teams like that, you kind of just are all over the place. Like I couldn't yeah. tell you who Tchaikovsky played with because he was kind of all over the place that time too. Uh, but that's pretty wild. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I mean, he, he's a productive guy, but obviously the Penguins at that time are, you know, a bit of a turnstile. They're, they're kind of just trying to find anything to grab a hold of, like you said. And on March 9th of 2003, which is going to end up being a big day for the Islanders, uh, Robitaille is traded from the Penguins to the Islanders for a fifth round pick in 2003. So what can you tell us about fifth round choice? Evgeny Iskahov? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. There you go. Well, of course not. Cause he didn't play in the NHL. A uh, cu- couple of guys. So that was in the fifth round. A uh, couple of guys who went after him. I'm just looking here. Mark Mathot went first pick in the sixth round. Um, 
Islanders legend Nate Thompson went a little bit later. Some guy named Joe Kav- Joe Pavelski went a little Ooh. while after that. And then uh, in the ninth round, though, the Penguins made up for it by drafting a guy named Matt Molson. So how about that? So yeah, so fifth round pick. Uh, not not too bad, I guess, for a, a guy you picked up on waivers who's pretty right. good. Although, again, you, you'd think that those numbers would have gotten a little something more for, for the Penguins. But uh, as an aside, this is also the same day that Mike Milbury, in acquiring, sending out a fifth-round pick to acquire Randy Robitaille, traded Claude Lapointe to Philly for a, a different fifth-round pick. And uh, as we told our friend Bill Matz when we did our uh, – episode on Ron Hextall. He's like, you know, we should, we should do a weird flyers podcast. And I was like, you can go ahead and do that, but we need to be on for the Claude Lapointe episode because uh, he's a, he's a favorite of ours. Uh, but that was, I remember that was a, that was a tough one. When they traded Claude that Lapointe was, yeah. Philly. <laughs> so he was, he was the prototypical, this guy's way too good to be on this team. Uh, and on, on a, on a good team, this guy is the perfect depth piece, but on the Islanders, he is the imperfect first or second line center. Like he really shouldn't be playing that position. But, uh, but yeah, this is where Randy Robitaille's first stint with the Islanders begins, and it's a short one. It's only ten games. Uh, he has one goal, two assists. Uh, this team did go to the playoffs. They lost to the Ottawa Senators. Uh, and uh, I don't know if this is really where he made a connection yet. I mean, Mike, you were still young at this time, but we've talked about this era being very, very formative for you. Do you remember specifically this this period of Robitaille, like the sort of Robitaille 1.0 period? Well, I remember the trade because I remember reading, you know, you, you'd find out about trades in the newspaper, basically. Yeah. And, and I remember reading it and, and being really upset about uh, Claude Lapointe because at that age, yeah, I was like, me too. OK, I get I get trading for players, but I don't really understand why you trade away a player <laughs> uh, who's as good as Claude Lapointe. And, and that was tough to handle. And then I think. Mm. Because they would write like the main article, like Islanders trade away Claude Lapointe, whatever, and then like mm. at the bottom there would just be like the notes section yeah. of the article, um, and it was just like, oh, and by the way, like they were they acquired this guy from the Penguins and uh, for for a fifth round pick, and so no, I I I I actually don't remember much from from Robitaille one point but I do know that when they reacquired him, I remembered him being on the Islanders, and I'm like, wait, they got Randy Robitaille? Back. Yeah, That's me too. Hilarious. Yeah, it was yeah I, the second one I remember, and then I was I remember thinking to myself during that second period, when did they get rid of him? I didn't even realize <laughs> they had gotten rid of him. But uh, but so it was a short stint. Uh, in August of two thousand and three, uh, he signed with the Atlanta Thrashers, and actually spent uh, a whole season down there. He had eleven goals, thirty seven points, and sixty nine games for the Thrashers. This was not their one playoff year, in case you're wondering. Uh, he ends up signing at the end of that season with uh, Nashville. But uh, he doesn't end up playing there again. He ends up being put on waivers in no- October of the season, maybe even before it starts. Ends up playing in Minnesota. If they have a weird wild podcast, I guarantee he'll get an episode of that too. No, again, 67 games, 40 points. I mean, those are good numbers. Like, I, I don't remember him playing for the, for the wild at all. This is kind of a shock to me. Uh, but that's a, that's a good number. But uh, I guess it wasn't good enough because uh, they let him walk. He signs with the Flyers. Nobody remembers this era at all. Uh, but so he signs with the Flyers in July, on July 4th of 06. By December of that year, he is traded to the Islanders again. He sent Mike York to the city of brotherly love for centerman Randy Robitaille, who led the Flyers with a 53.6 faceoff winning percentage. In 28 games, Robitaille has tallied five goals and 12 assists, while York has amassed six goals and seven assists in 32 games this season. By the Philadelphia Flyers, and a guy he coached briefly this year is now an Islander. His first game back at the Coliseum, Randy Robitaille, face-off, coming right up. And this is sort of where the bulk of the, the Robitaille memories come from, I think, for Islanders fans. With a fifth-round pick, uh, and in exchange, the Flyers got Mike York. Uh, who uh, I remember playing for the Islanders. You know, it seemed like he was going to be a lot better. He was acquired for Michael Pekka. That was that was never going to work out for poor Mike York. I, I feel bad for him. <laughs> Nobody wanted to see Michael Pekka traded, and uh, certainly not for an ex-Ranger. So we'll have to, we could do a whole deep dive on Mike York at some point. But this is one of my favorite fun facts of this entire show. And I, I've, I can't, but my mind has been blown for an entire weekend after figuring this out and finding this out. So, Robitaille and a fifth round pick come to the Islanders for Mike York. Obviously, Robitaille plays the rest of the season for them. That fifth round pick was used in the 2008 draft to take 
a man out of Sarnia named Matt Martin, who is still currently on the Islanders in the year 2024. Uh, and that is mind boggling. That is absolutely mind boggling. Uh, Adam, we did an episode on Peter Regan, who signed with the Islanders uh, to play with his buddy, Franz Nielsen. Didn't work out. They traded him to Chicago. The Islanders sent that pick to Washington to, you know, for the rights to Yaroslav Halak. The Caps traded that pick to the Rangers, and the Rangers used it to take a guy named Igor Shesterkin. Wow. So somehow <laughs> Peter Regan <laughs> turned into Igor Shesterkin. This isn't quite as mind blowing as that, but seeing Matt Martin here uh, is, is, pretty wild but uh yeah this is this is sort of the now as a as a robotai fan yourself like did you ever did you wake up at some point during this era and be like holy crap why is randy robotai on the islanders again <laughs> like this is kind of a weird he's, this is like true journeyman shit like he'd by now he'd played for eight different teams but like do you have any recollection of him playing for the islanders and maybe torturing the penguins at some point um i i have a very vague memory of mm. the ryan malone hat trick game Wow. Yeah. Like, because I, I remember him getting the hat trick and I, I remember, I don't know that I remember that it was Randy Robitaille scoring, mm. like, like taking over the game. I, I don't remember <laughs> that part, but I do have a vivid memory of that particular game, but yeah. the Randy Robitaille part escaped me. The, so the Penguins were white hot at that time yeah. too. That's why it was such like a big game and a crossroads at that season. Um, and. The 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 weirdness of this trade is is doesn't end with the Matt Martin thing. The Islanders made two trades with the Flyers within a week that year. Mm -hmm. So they traded York for Robitaille, and then like three days later or three days before that, they traded Jitnik for Freddie Meyer. That's right. It did right. two separate trades with the Flyers. So on mm. December sixteenth, they traded uh, Jitnik, and then on December twentieth of that same year they traded so mike york to the flyers uh for robitaille so it just yeah really weird um it, and it, 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 sorry it it should be noted though that so now robitaille again this is the second time with the islanders he was acquired by two separate islanders general managers one was mike milbury and this time it was garth snow right so yeah, i think true. he's probably the first person to have ever had that kind of distinction <laughs> right and um this this the the names like the trade trees here are crazy because that uh Zhitnik ends up turning into Braden Coburn uh who ends up finishing his career with the Islanders did he yeah. retire right after yes. his 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 one game stint with the Islanders I and so, uh yeah. good god um but I was I was kind of digging Mike York when they first traded for him I was like this is kind of cool like I remember him uh you know, that rookie of the year year with the Rangers. And then uh, he, he was, you know, pretty, he was like decent enough with, with those Oilers. And you yeah. think, he, you know, he could skate. He also had pretty cool skates uh, himself. He had those, those same kind of silver skates that, that Robitaille had actually. Um, but it, it got old pretty quickly. It got pretty stale <laughs> with, with Mike York pretty quickly. And uh, he ends up with a pretty forgettable season, season and a half. And, yeah. Um, but when they traded for Robitaille, I was, I was pretty excited because the Islanders ended up that this season just having such a funny roster. It was such yeah. a mercenary team. You look at the roster and basically nobody is homegrown outside mm. of uh, you know, <laughs> DiPietro uh, and Campoli. Uh, right. You know, Franz Nielsen comes in and out. You could say Trent Hunter was homegrown, too, because you know, he, they didn't draft him, but he was basically, uh, you know, a lifelong Islander. But mm. you... Robita so Robitaille comes into this team and he gets put on a he, he's a center who, or he can play left wing I think at center and, and he ends up playing with like Victor Kozlov who in a weird way was just the Russian version of and a better player than Randy Robitaille but the yeah. same kind of player like very crafty yeah. smart slick guys who maybe they didn't think too much of the defensive uh, side of the game but uh, when they got the the puck on their stick and they had time they were either scoring or finding someone open. And mm. uh, I just remember Robitaille having instant chem chemistry with Chris Simon of all people, yes. yeah. because uh, Simon had a pretty good shot for, that was like an underrated shot and Robitaille just found him and, mm. and Robitaille slotted in and, and obviously wasn't going to come in and, and take over like the top line with the team with, you know, Yashin and Shatan and, uh, Kozlov, Blake was that was the year Blake scored forty. So, yeah. and then you had the Sillinger Hunter Hilbert line is like a really good checking line. 
um, Richard Park on that, you know, fourth line staple, with, whether it would be with like Franz Nielsen or whoever was like rotating in as, as uh, down there. So he, him, yeah, like Aaron Asham and, and uh, Chris Simon, like they would play a lot together, I feel like. And Robitaille made them good. Like he made yeah. these guys good because he just would find them. You know, he'd draw a defender down or towards him and then you would find Chris Simon on like two on one or something. And mm-hmm. Simon would, would deposit it or Asham would hit his one timer, which was pretty good. And um uh, he he Robitaille in a weird way kind of changed the season. Um mm-hmm. and gave the Islanders this very passable middle six and mm-hmm. uh of that group of that of that middle six, like he was so much fun to watch, I thought. And it was really, you know, they end up going to the playoffs in that wild run. He played a pretty big part in, in the entire season. This was um, the Ryan Smith year. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, they, they went all in and who, got Who Ryan was Smith. the bigger trade at that season? I don't know. <laughs> like, it's it's hard to tell. Um, but yeah. they uh, he, he had a huge hand in this season. Yeah. And then he was gone. Yeah. Just yeah, like, like that. This is Boom. He was gone. Just, just <laughs> gone. Again, though, the, the pattern continues. 50 games, six goals 23 points so again just under half a point of player a game it's so funny it's crazy but yeah he he shows up and uh yeah who who is the real captain Canada here is it ryan smith or is it randy robitaille i think <laughs> might, might be randy robitaille um but yeah so he he's gone just like that just in a flash he's left and you know again this was you know the islanders were, were also trying to just piece people together and, and put a team together and R- smith obviously left that summer uh blake left i think that was i also bought out yash and so Big big changes were coming, and then within a year of that, they you know they really bottomed out in 07, 08, and then got the Tavares pick in oh nine. Um, and uh, Robitaille ended up playing for his hometown Ottawa Senators. He signed there in uh, two thousand and seven, uh, and again this this may you know surprise you sixty eight games, ten goals, twenty nine points. So again, just under half a point a game. <laughs> Uh, maybe a little bit less, but he, then he starts the sort of international tour. Uh, he did play in the AHL in San Antonio for a while. He played in, in Russia. He played in Sweet in uh, Switzerland. Uh, he played for three different teams in the KHL, two different teams in, in the Swiss league and uh, just kind of disappeared from the radar. But like Adam, you know, you know, Randy Robitaille, I always ask like people on this show, you know, do you have any recollection of him, you know, playing in Europe or playing for Russia or any of these other places? But, you know, Robitaille is one of those guys that just sort of like when he drops off the radar, he's just gone. And then like maybe in a quiet moment, you think to yourself, man, how great was Randy Robitaille when he played for the Penguins? Like, it, has this guy come up on your radar at all at any point since, you know, 2007 when he signed with the, the Senators? He's one of those guys that he just disappears as mysteriously as he arrived. That's right. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's like just, Batman. He's yeah. just gone. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think... I've thought about Randy Robitaille probably more often than most Penguins fans have um, just because of my own personal memories of of that era and going to games Mm. and falling in love with going to hockey games. Because when I was a kid, I didn't get to a lot of hockey games because I was growing up in the, 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 like the peak of the Lemieux years. And I come, I came from a very, you know, blue collar family. Like we didn't have a lot of money. We could go to baseball games, but mm-hmm. hockey games was just a price level that right. we could not get to. So I never actually had a chance to go to games. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't until the student rush program came in that I got to go a lot. And just going to games regularly and, and seeing live NHL hockey was just such a thrill for me. And I, I just have, I have memories of those teams. I have fond memories of them. And, you know, Randy Robitaille. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty i know he, again he's just one of these guys it's just like he's there and he's so important so quickly i mean i have videos here he he loved to score against the flyers for some reason maybe he was he was angry about his uh short stint there play by picard there stepping in front of robot time martina pinches sanderson can't clear it past him so chatan feeds it down low robot scores well, it started with an effective pinch by Radic Martinic, and Randy Robitaille makes it one to nothing, New York. And he can pinch there. He uh, scored in a, sh- a shootout winner over the Leafs, which was like a really, really impressive goal. This is uh, pre Franz Nielsen back. You know, the, the Islanders would go through a period when they won every shootout, thanks mainly to Franz Nielsen. But uh, before that, you needed a Randy Robitaille, apparently. 
Robitaille is going to be the third Islander shooter. Randy Robitaille. Here he goes. Taking it wide. Scores! Agarowski has to score. Good play here by Robitaille. Takes the shot. And then gets it up into the top of the net. Shooting third for Toronto, number 23, Alexei Monkorovsky. Randy Robitaille with a go-ahead goal. are six and four in the shootout this year none bigger than right there what a play by the goaltender Di Pietro to poke check the puck off the stick of Ponikarovsky uh and uh yeah it's he's just one of those guys that like you look back and you're like man th- without this guy this team never makes the playoffs they never do anything and and that like Mike said that was just a wild year even before that was Garth Snow's first year at the helm so it started out like wait, who's the GM now? And ends up with him trading for Ryan Smith. He ends up winning the, the, the hockey news GM of the year and they go to the playoffs and it, it, it's just a wild ride. And, and Randy Robitaille was as much a part of that as anybody else. Uh, these days, Randy Robitaille has not left the game. He is in fact an agent uh, and, and uh, he's on LinkedIn if you want to go find him there. And uh, like one of his clients is Brant Clark who plays for the Kings. And uh, you know, he, he hasn't left the game. Like Mike said, he's been at alumni days and, I'm glad that he recognizes that his Islanders time is like fondly remembered. Like we always talk about what, what do guys think that their like legacy is? And and I think Randy Robitaille is acutely aware of his, his legacy as an Islander. I don't know if he's going to any uh, predators alumni game, you know, <laughs> not twice as many games for them. Uh, but Adam, you, you were saying when we, when we were talking about coming on, uh, there's one aspect of Randy Robitaille that we haven't really gotten to. And that is in fact, his last name. Now, Randy, for those who may not know, is in no relation to the great Luke Robitaille, <laughs> the highest scoring left wing in the history of the NHL and obviously a Kings Hall of Famer. And I guess it's everybody Hall of Famer now. Um, and uh, apparently uh, you and you and were there when uh, somebody asked Randy about this and uh, it didn't go well <laughs> in a parking so, lot somewhere. <laughs> so one of the one of the many student rush games, one of one of the friends that I went with, he was a huge autograph seeker right and like we were high school kids like you know and he knew where the penguins parking lot was Mm. and we would always go and hang out after games and he would get his autographs and i had nothing to get signed so i was just wearing like a blank like penguins jersey and i had the player as they came out they would just sign the logo and like so i i have a jersey hanging in my basement that is autographed by about Two thirds of one of the worst penguin teams in the <laughs> Um and That's Randy amazing. Robitaille is included on awesome. that jersey. Awesome. Um, I think I think Kovalev is the most prominent name on there. Right. Uh, but other than Randy Robitaille, of course. Um, <laughs> but there was one particular night where we were all waiting there, and Randy Robitaille comes out and. He's being really friendly with everybody. He's just happy that like people are talking to him. He's right. happy to sign everything. <laughs> like he he's just being really polite. He's he's engaging in conf- like it's very it's a very genuine moment that he's having with people that you know he's like, Hey, thanks for coming out, thanks for supporting mm-hmm. us. Sorry we couldn't win. Like, <laughs> you know, just really friendly. And I vividly remember, and this is one of my one of my top Randy Robotime moments. Mm. The guy standing next to me as he's signing something asks him, are you related to Luke? Mm -hmm. I've never seen a person's entire mood and demeanor change more (laughs) rapidly than in that moment. It must be a question he has been asked from the moment he started playing hockey. Absolutely. From the moment he started playing professional hockey, 
everybody probably assumed, whoa, he's got to be related to Luke Robitaille. <laughs> and I cannot even imagine what it has to be like to work your way to the pinnacle of your your right. your, your 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 profession, make it to the highest level, and the first thing people ask is, <laughs> "Are you related to somebody else?" Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> somebody way better than you. By yeah, the way, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just vividly remember Robitaille immediately turning and staring daggers through wow. the guy. Like, if looks could kill, this guy would have been dead four times. Oh, my God. And he just very sternly and, like, almost aggressively just goes, no. <laughs> and he went back to signing autographs. Oh and, really like, the guy, like, the guy that asked, he was, like, absolutely horrified. Like, sure, oh, yeah. Like, oh, my God. And it's funny because Luke actually spent one season with the Penguins. Yeah. And, and, and people, a lot of people forget that. Um, it was the uh, it was the ninety four ninety five lockout season. Yeah. So there was only like forty games that year, but he played one season with the Penguins. So yeah. he, like Luke was a very prominent, you know, like you know, a name sure. in, in, in Penguins history. So I, yeah. I, I get why the guy asked, but like, yeah, that that might have been that's really funny. That, that's one of my top, like probably my, that, that was that was the incident that made me want to pick Randy <laughs> Robitaille, just because I vividly remember that. That's and amazing. just how just like you 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 could just see in that moment how many times he's been asked it, how right. many times he's had to answer it, and just mm. I'm an NHL player too. I'm good. Right. Like I belong yeah. here. Like I got here on my own. And mm. I, I I yeah, it was just uh it was it was a really in hindsight really funny thing to watch play out. That is but, really uh, up until that point, Randy Robitaille was like one of the friendliest guys. That came out. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the trick. Don't don't ever ask him about Luke. Uh, I will never forget that Luke Robitaille played for the Penguins because I remember going to a theater in 1996, I want to say, and watching a little movie called Sudden Death. That's right. The great uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. And they're the Penguins in the game. In the movie, the Penguins are in the Stanley Cup final. And Luke Robitaille is on the team. And at that point, he had already been traded to the Rangers. And so my friends and I all went, when did they make this movie? <laughs> like, Luke Robitaille has been a Ranger for like half a season. Wow. Okay. So but, but one of the funniest that. things about that is Luke Robitaille was, I believe, the only actual, well, there were, there were two actual NHL players in that movie. Mm. Luke Robitaille was one of them. Right. And he like used his real name. Mm. The other one was former longtime Pittsburgh Penguin, Jay Caulfield. Right. Jay Caulfield played the Penguins goalie by the name of Brad Tolliver. <laughs> now, the reason that the Penguins goalie's name was Brad Tolliver was because the Penguins goalie at the time, Tom Barrasso, was the only player on the Penguins or the Chicago Blackhawks that would not let the movie use his name. Oh, wow. And I like to imagine that that is why they made the Penguins goalie just the biggest asshole on that team <laughs> and all they did was they flipped the initials from tb to b right and <laughs> that's, that's really funny oh man wow that's amazing yeah wow, look at that nhl trivia movie trivia you get it all in this episode i love it i love it that's i mean now i'm gonna go watch sudden death again that's amazing that's an amazing story this whole episode has been amazing adam i can't thank you enough i hope you've had a lot of fun oh i have so just flipping back to the current day Penguins real quick. Um, we're Islanders fans. Obviously, we're, we're, we're not going to see eye to eye, I think, on a lot of things. Uh, but uh, like, where do we think, where do you think the Penguins go from here? I mean, are they going to try and band-aid this up and try and make a run with these guys again next year? Like you said, a lot of guys are on on uh, long-term deals. Or do you think they finally start moving some of these guys and, and try and get at least a little bit younger and start to think about a life without Crosby in them? Well, I think they're going to get a little bit younger, but I don't think that they're going to totally tear it down just mm -hmm. yet. I, I think as long as as Sid is still playing at a high level, they're probably going to try to do that uh, kind of rebuild on the fly sort of thing as long as they can. And um, it, it would not surprise me on July 1st, uh, the day he's allowed to sign a new extension, that he probably signs like a two or three year deal just to finish his career. Because um, that would match up with what Latang and Malkin and, and now Carlson have left. Um, yeah. I, I think as long as those guys are here, 
they're not going anywhere. They have no movement clauses. They have no desire <laughs> to move. Yeah. Um, that, that never works out well for anybody, but I think that's the way it's going to go. <laughs> so, sounds a lot like the Islanders, actually. So it'll be fun to see these two teams uh, see how they can, you know, patch everything up uh, in, in, in the same division. And I, I guarantee there's at least one more playoff series in these two teams, probably before it's all said and done. Uh, tell everybody where they can find you again. You're all over Twitter. And if you're not following Adam, you definitely should be, but uh, where can everybody find your work uh, so they can uh, hear more about it? The, the Penguins, yeah, uh, uh, from right. a, a good Penguins fan. I got to say there, there's a lot out there that are a little <laughs> sketchy, but Adam's one of the good ones. So definitely follow him. Yeah, you can find me at Pensburg. Uh, you can find me at Bleacher Report. Do a lot of NHL stuff there. You can find me over at Yard Barker, where I do pretty much every sport. Um, <laughs> but for hockey stuff, uh, Pensburg, Bleacher Report, uh, and on Twitter, at Agretz. There you go. Thank you so much, Adam. We really appreciate you coming on. I hope you had a good time. I did. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Mike, uh, where can everybody find you on Twitter? Uh, the Big Lee Basket with two E's. Follow Mike at the Big Lebowski. Read and listen to his work at Action Network. Of course, read Lighthouse Hockey every single day for your most up-to-date Islanders news and discussion. Our theme song is Knuckles by Bjorn Falk. Following more of his music on Bandcamp and at Spotify. Shop VintageIceHockey.com. Try wines from the Pinot Project. Any final thoughts on yeah. Islanders hero Randy Robitaille? asking players if they're related to better players than they are <laughs> and, and, and angering them uh, after games. Uh, we've covered a lot here. So uh, you have the floor. When I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not being hyperbolic. I promise it. And, and hearing a fan of a different team, watch a different version of, of Randy Robitaille say a similar thing yeah. really validates this claim, which was, <laughs> And I think the if you know, you know meme is is mm. kind of a cliche at this point. But if you watched Randy Robitaille in that 2006-2007 season, there was a point where you thought to yourself, this might be the best player on the planet. Yeah. And then he was gone. And he was playing for the San Antonio Rampage not that long <laughs> after. So, Randy, what a pleasure it was, man. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. That season was such a magical run. You played a huge part in it. I'll never forget your skates. Um, and I'll never forget that that win over the Penguins on uh, February 17th, uh, 2007. Um, just 10 days, I think, before they traded for Ryan Smith. Like, and he, he played a huge part in that one. Um, Marc-Andre Fleury in those yellow pads. I can see Marc-Andre oh, yeah. Fleury skating after. You know how he would do that little skate after he let up a goal? Like yeah. to the corner in those, yeah, and he was wearing those macaroni and cheese pads. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Randy, Randy Robitaille, he was... He was a special one, so uh, I've been. That's I'm why I remember that game so vividly. February seventeenth is my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's an exciting birthday! Oh my gosh, Ryan Malone hat trick, Randy Robitaille just laying waste to the Penguins, aren't yellow pads? Oh man, what what? A, well, that's crazy. Oh, the mystery solved. Oh my goodness. This has been a wild ride. And uh, thank you, Randy Robitaille. And thank you, Adam Gretz. And thank you, Michael Leboff. And thank you all for listening. Uh, make sure to uh, check out Fans First Sports Network, uh, which is where we are at. And uh, again, we'd like to hockey every single day. Thanks a lot. We'll be back in another couple of weeks with a new episode. Until then, keep the Islanders weird. We'll talk to you later. Bye.